Welcome, everyone. Welcome and good evening. It's great to see all of you here tonight. Come on in, grab a seat, <coughs> Clint, and uh, we'll get started this evening. Let's stand up together for hymn number 467, When We All Get to Heaven, all four verses. shout down here too, isn't it? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, it's good to see everybody tonight. It's good to be in a nice, cool facility. Our air conditioners are pumping as hard as they can. So we'll do our best and try to behave, not stir up any heat. This morning, we had two people saved, one adult from the auditorium, an older man trusted Christ as his Savior. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. And in junior church, Braley Hull trusted Christ as her Savior. Amen. God's in the soul-saving business. And as long as we honor the Lord by seeking to lead people to the Lord through Jesus Christ, he'll honor us. Isn't that wonderful? God saves people. We're just agents. We're the messenger. And uh, his message is Jesus still saves. Praise the Lord for that. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you the glory tonight for two precious souls this morning that turn from their sins and turn to Christ. Thank you, Lord. You've done that for us. There came a point in our lives when we did the same thing. Some of us have been saved a long time now, and here too today just got saved and on their way to heaven fresh and new. Thank you, Lord, that you're still saving souls through the ministries of this church. Help us to keep on keeping on till you call us home. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please have a seat. And let's all turn now to hymn number 473. 473, when we all get to heaven, oh, that will be glory for me. I hope it will for you. All three verses. Glory for 
that will be glory. a baby shower for Lene Boggs, and uh, her husband wants to make the announcement. Bailey, would you stand up, please, and make the announcement? He'd been telling me that for days. <laughs> Bring your own towels and soap. Uh, <laughs> and that will be August the 12th at 10.30 in the morning. It's a boy registered at Walmart and Amazon. Invitations on the table in the back. Back to school Sunday on the 13th. Boy, you're starting school too early, seems like, anymore. But that's the way it is. Team bowling on the 19th. Has anybody, any teenager in the church, ever beaten Clint at bowling? Raise your hand. No? Okay. Well, then I'll up the offer. <laughs> if you beat him, I'll double it. Whatever I was going to give you is double. <laughs> but I want it to be honest. I don't want any cheating. Don't put bumper guards on your... Uh, all right, that's on the 19th, and the missions conference on September the 9th through the 13th. We've got a lot of people already signing up for the food, so that's good, and if others want to sign up, it's at the table in the back. You can host all the missionaries, which would be quite a few, or you can just host one family. Take one family out to eat, take them all out to eat, don't take any out to eat, don't do anything, as God would direct you. And we have a wedding announcement. I announced it last week. Joe and Lene. I mean, I did, I did that last week too. Kaylin, I'm trying to marry your wife off to somebody else, what I'm doing. <laughs> Joseph and Kaylin, what's on cue? Friday, September the 1st, 7 o'clock in the evening. The wedding ceremony will be here with a reception to follow, September the 1st. Ah, uh, Kaylin and Joseph, amen. Now, last week I told you I was going to write a song about fried green tomatoes. Well, I didn't do it. Brother Bragg heard me mention the fried green tomatoes and gave me money to buy some out at this new restaurant here in Webb City called the Flat Iron. Flat Creek, Flat Creek. And uh, went out there and had some the other day, and they are good. They high, they're pretty high, but they're good. But I did come across a song I remembered from the 80s named Homegrown Tomatoes. You remember that song? John Denver sang it. You need to pull it up and listen to it. I have some of the words here. And to me, I agree with this song 100%. There's nothing in the world like a homegrown tomato. Ain't nothing in the world that I like better than bacon and lettuce and homegrown tomatoes. Up in the morning, out in the garden, get you a ripe one, don't get a hard one. Plant them in the spring, eat them in the summer. All winter with items, a culinary bummer. I forgot all about the sweating and the digging every time I go out and pick me a big one. Homegrown tomatoes, what life be without homegrown tomatoes? Only two things that money can't buy. That's true love and homegrown tomatoes. <laughs> well, you can go out and eat them, that's for sure. But there's nothing that a homegrown tomato won't cure. Put them in a salad, put them in a stew, make your own very own tomato juice. Eat them with eggs, eat them with gravy, eat them with beans, pinto, and navy. Put them on the side, put them in the middle. Homegrown tomatoes are hot on the griddle. Doesn't that make you want one? <laughs> I'm going to go home and eat one after church. I had one today at noontime. You know, you don't have them for long, and then they're gone. Uh, but boy, they're a blessing when they're here. Thank you, Brother Block. Amen. 
as he was doing that, I was reminded of another blessing as well, and the blessing was tonight that he read that rather than saying it. I appreciate that very much. Let's stand up together for our offertory hymn, hymn number 470. 470, what a day that will be. We'll sing both verses, ushers on that last. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day that will be. What a day that will be when my Jesus I shall see. Father, we love you tonight. We're grateful for your blessings to us. We thank you that you are, you have prepared a place for us. Oh, as we come tonight, may you speak to our hearts. May you bless in the time we have together and use the message, Lord, to draw us closer to you. Lord, bless in this church and the ministries of it. We thank you for all those who are a part and do so much, Lord, to further your kingdom. Bless again tonight in this service. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Ephesians chapter 3. And while you're turning, I'm going to ask you a question. Do you know why you were born? You know why God had you brought into this world? Revelation chapter 4 verse 11 tells us, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. You were created to please God. And the way you please God is by living your life and giving him the glory from your life. To God be the glory. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end, Amen. As you know, I was not brought up a Baptist. The church that I grew up in, we sang what is called the doxology every Sunday. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. I forget exactly how it goes. But... They would sing that. We would sing that when the ushers were bringing the offering. See, here we receive the offering and the men go out and put it someplace. In that church, the men received the offering and then brought it back down front and put it back on the table while we sang the doxology. And the word doxology comes from the word glory, the glory of God. But I was particularly interested in that song because we're singing about all creatures here below. And when I was about eight years old, no, I guess, I, yeah, about eight years old, a movie came out called The Creature from the Black Lagoon. And I wondered what The Creature from the Black Lagoon had to do with church. Now, if you've never seen that old black and white show, you ought to look at it sometime. It's real corny. 
is real grainy probably by now. And uh, I didn't understand what a creature in church was different from the creature from the Black Lagoon. The word glory receives its title from the Greek word doxa, doxology. So whether you're singing a hymn or singing a gospel song or praying or serving, whatever you're doing, make sure everything you do is for the glory of God. Is that not what the Bible says? Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all for the glory of God. This is one of the richest and most significant passages in the Word of God, these verses here in Ephesians. I want to focus tonight on four words. Unto, in verse 21, unto him be glory. Unto Jesus be glory. Everything else just modifies those words. So let's examine these two verses. Let's go back to verse 20. Now, to him that is able. It doesn't get much deeper than that, actually. To him that is able. And that connects us, those words, those six simple words, connect us to the doctrine of salvation. And it says, now. Now, that does not mean chronologically now, as in the process of time. Now is the time. It means now that I've said all these things back in chapters 1 and 2, and all of chapter 3, really. Now that I've said this, here is what we're supposed to do. If we had time, and we've studied it in Sunday school in the past, I'm sure, we've studied the book of Ephesians. It's divided into two sections. The first part is uh, theological, doctrinal, and the second part is practical. And as the doctrinal section comes to a close at the end of chapter 3, here he says, now, now unto him. So we need to stop for a moment and just be reminded of some of the things that he's taught us in the first three chapters. And I won't go through all of it, but I'll just mention several from chapter 1. For example, in chapter 1, it says God chose you in Christ. Aren't you glad he did? If you come to Christ, God chooses you. In chapter 1, verse 5, it says God predestined you to adoption. In other words, he determined beforehand, if you will come to Jesus, you will be adopted into the family. If you will come. In chapter 1, verse 6, it says God accepted you in the Beloved. Chapter 1, verse 7, it says God cleansed you by his blood and forgave your sins. Chapter 1, verse 11, we are in heaven inheritance in the Lord Jesus Christ with God the Father. Chapter 1, verse 13, God sealed you by the Holy Spirit. Once saved, always saved. Amen? Once, I mean, he, you're sealed. Signed, sealed, you have yet to be delivered, but you will be. So that's just six things from chapter 1 that we need to give God the glory for. Now, all of that makes, would, might make us think, well, I'm pretty special. God has chosen me. I'm adopted. I can't lose my salvation. I'm accepted. I'm cleansed. Boy, I must be something else. No, that does not give us any reason at all to boast. Because the very next chapter tells us we are dead in our trespasses and sins. Boy, that's pretty bad, going from all this good stuff in chapter 1 to being dead in our trespasses and sins. The Bible says that once we got saved, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, everybody here knows those verses, for by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves as a gift of God, lest any man should boast. Ah, not of works, lest any man should boast. So you're no longer a stranger or a foreigner or an illegal alien you are part of the saints of the household of God. So when we get to chapter 3, he says, Now, because of all of that good stuff that God has rescued you from and preserved you and adopted you and is, is keeping you, because of all that, now here's what you're supposed to experience. Look at verse 18 of chapter 3. 
that ye may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. And then down in verse 21, to him be the glory. So when the Apostle Paul says, first of all, now, now that you know all this, now that you know it, then it says, unto him. Now, there are a lot of analogies about being saved or being in the church, and in every one of them, Jesus Christ is in first place. The Bible says he's the shepherd. What are we? The sheep. He's the vine. What are we? The branches. He's the captain. What are we? We're the army. He's the chief cornerstone. He's the, we're the building. He's the bridegroom, we're the bride. He's the head, we're the body. It says in chapter 1 of Ephesians, Unto him gave, him gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. The church is his body. Now, I don't talk about, I'm not talking about these four walls and that steeple and these classrooms. I'm talking about the believer. He is the head of believers. Do you believe that? It's the truth. The head is not the pope. It's not a priest. It's not a cardinal. It's not a bishop. The head is not a pastor or a deacon or a church member. The head is not a board or a committee or denomination. The head is Jesus. He's the head of the local church, and he's the head of you. If Jesus is pleased, it doesn't matter who else is displeased. And if Jesus is not pleased, it doesn't matter who else we please. So he's the head, and we're the body. And the body exists to serve the head. That's what we're here for, doing what the head says do. He is the head of the body. Colossians 1.18, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. Now, a lot of times when we talk about the church being the body of Christ, we talk about the individual members, and we're trying to associate every part needing every other part. Like your hand needs your foot, and your knee needs your thigh. Every part just needs every other part, total dependence of the body on other parts. But here he's talking about the total dependence of the body on the head. Modern man, a lot of modern men, don't believe in eternal life. They do not believe that there's a heaven or a hell. And that leads them to do very foolish, crazy things. I think about the family of the great baseball player named Ted Williams. Ted Williams is one of the best baseball players who ever lived. When he died, the family put his body or his head in biostasis cryonics, freezing it, so that when science catches up to what killed him, the disease of old age and everything else he had going on, they can revive him and bring him back to life. And they cut your head off to do that. And there are numbers of people. A lot of them are in Arizona. I don't know why Arizona is a hotbed for that. Don't go to Arizona. They might put you in stasis. Now, the head needs the body. The body needs the head. You can function without your toe. You can function without your foot. You can function without your leg. You can function without your finger or your thumb or your hand or your arm. You can even function without your kidneys, although you'll be on dialysis forever. And you can live without your heart as long as you're on a heart machine if you're hooked up. But you've never heard of anybody being kept alive when his head is severed from his body. You can take a perfectly good specimen of a prime human being in the prime of his life and cut his head off and everything dies. 
Nobody's ever been hooked up to an artificial head. It's not going to happen. You cannot function without the head. And the head of our lives and the head of our church is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, because of everything I've said, now here's what we do. Unto him and only him. There's no other him available. He's the only him. Look at what it says. Unto him who is able. Now that describes the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know how powerful he is? The Bible says in Matthew, he is able to take rocks and raise them up to children of Abraham. The Bible said, what power that is. The power said he is able to destroy the both soul and the body in hell. What power that is. He is able to graft unbelievers into the family. He's able to establish the gospel. He's able, has all power to make you, all grace abound to you. He's able to come to the aid of everybody who's tempted. He he's, has the power, he's able to raise people from the dead. What power he has. And yet we think our problems are just beyond his ability to help us. They're not. But I want to focus in on a couple. Number one, he is able to pardon everybody who needs to be saved. For by grace are you saved. And then once he saves you, he's able to save to the uttermost all those who come to God through him. And he's able to cast all of our sins into the depths of the deepest sea so that no man can plumb that depth and find them. He's able to do that. God has all power. He's also able to purify. Listen to another now unto him. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, blameless and with great joy. Jude, verse 24. He's able to make you blameless. Well, Brother Morgan, I have sins in my life. Everybody does. But when you're blameless before God, that doesn't mean you've never sinned. It means he doesn't longer hold them accountable on your record. I heard a preacher say, a famous preacher. I've been to his church and listened to him preach numbers of times. He says, when a man gets saved, and I think he's very wrong, that's why I'm saying this. When a man gets saved, God works a miracle on himself, so he, rem he forgets all your sins. God doesn't forget anything. When the Bible talks about he remembers our sins no more, it's a legal term. They're no longer on your record. They, your record is wiped clean. Aren't you glad for that? Well, some of us got a very pretty bad record. He's able to purify. He's also able to preserve. We see that in the first chapter. And he's given us the earnest of the inheritance, the guarantee of redemption. I know whom I have believed and am persuaded. He's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I love the way some of the old songs talk about stuff like this. One great hymn puts it this way. And when I think that God sent his son, not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great thou art. I sing that sometimes. When I go out and look at the stars and the moon at night, I sing that. When we think of how great his salvation is, we ought to say glory to his name. So whatever you're facing tonight in your family, in your life, personally, at your job, what you're dealing with, God's able. God is able. Now look at verse 20. Now this is a mouthful. To do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. According to the power. Now, I've never been to New York. I've never seen Niagara Falls. I've seen pictures of it lots of times. 
But they say, somebody once said, it's the greatest unused power source in the world. I don't know anything about that, but I do know the greatest unused power source is the lives of weak, anemic, falling, failing Christians. And you've got the power of God at your disposal. You've got God with you, God in you. And look at how his strength is, des is described. It is exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask <laughs> or think. Now, the word exceeding is the word hyper. You ever had a hyperactive child? What happens? He's got lots more energy than anybody else. Hyperactive thyroid, what happens? Makes more hormones than normal. And it is abundantly, super abundant, excessive, beyond measure. It's hyper beyond hyper. Matthew Henry calls it the inexhaustible fullness of God. It's more than normal and exceeds expectation. I mean, just think about it. When Pharaoh had Israel up against the Red Sea, nobody could have imagined what was going to happen next. And God had the power to do it. And he did it. When a teenage shepherd boy walked down into the valley of Elah to face a giant nine feet nine inches tall whose spear weighed 20 pounds, nobody could imagine what would happen. But God gave him the power. Lunchtime of thousands of people. Nobody brought anything. There's no McDonald's or Hardee's or Brahms or anything. One little boy had five loaves and two fishes. Nobody could have imagined what would happen next. God has the power. When they've caught a woman in adultery and dragged her into the midst of men, nobody could have imagined what would happen next because I'm sure she thought, well, they're going to stone me to death because it's in the law. She had, no, in her wildest dream, she would not have thought to hear the sweet words of Jesus. Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. And one dark afternoon when they laid a dead carpenter, so to speak, in a borrowed tomb, Nobody could have imagined what would happen three days later. Folks, God has all power. Are you sick? God has power. Is your marriage in trouble? God has power. Are you failing spiritually? God has power. That's power above and beyond. Notice it says, above all that we could ask or even think about asking. The minute we start thinking about what it could be, it's beyond that. So if you can say it, his strength is higher. If you can write it, his strength is higher. If you can type it, his strength is greater. Unimaginable strength and immeasurable strength. Unimaginable and without measure. And the word power there is our word for dynamite. Out of his power. Now, if a multimillionaire gave you $10 out of his wealth. It is not according to his wealth. Notice the term, according to the power that worketh in us. But if he gave you $5 million, that's according to his wealth. So according to means this. You can look at the gift and you can look at the giver and get some kind of idea about how he's able to do it idea of his ability to give the power to give and God has the power to give us all things richly to enjoy the next term according to his power that worketh in us God wants to work in such a way in your life that people will say nobody but God could have done that I mean, only a God who can fling the stars into space could have saved that marriage. Only a God who hangs the earth on nothing could have brought that prodigal back to his family. Only a God who can rain down fire on Mount Carmel to set that person free from the demon rum and alcohol. Only a God who can cleanse the lepers could have restored that home. And only a God who could call the dead out of their graves could have saved that man that we all thought was beyond saving. 
is too far gone. Only a God who has all power can do those things. Here's our part. Unto him be glory in the church. That's the ecclesia, the called out assembly of believers. That's right here what we're doing tonight. And it's specifically given to the church at Ephesus, but it's available for all of us. So when we show up for church, we're here to give him the glory. We're not here to praise us. Nobody here deserves any praise. God deserves all the praise. And you can't praise God like this on the ball field. I thank God for <coughs> Christian athletes and coaches. But this is called, talking about when you come together as the body of Christ. When you come together as the church, the assembly who have been redeemed by the blood. And notice it says, by Christ Jesus. How do you give glory to God the Father? By Christ Jesus. How do you get saved? Through Christ Jesus. Who created the universe? Christ Jesus, the second agent of the Godhead. In other words, all the assembly of the saved. All glory comes by Christ Jesus, through Christ Jesus, because of Jesus, ultimately to Jesus. And then it says this, until the end of the ages, throughout all ages, world without end. And that's what we want to do with our lives, bring glory to God here and now and world without end, out into eternity future. Your football team, you may get glory in them this year, and they'll break your heart next year. A new position or promotion at work may bring you glory today, but sooner or later, it'll fade. Your possessions, your trophies, your accolades, these things go out of style, and they fade away. Only one life, the song says, will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And what verse did I begin with? Worthy art thou, O Lord, to receive honor and power and glory. For thou hast created all things, and for your pleasure they are created. So you want to have some motivation to bring glory to God in your life this week? I'll give you a couple, and then we'll go home. Down at the cross where my Savior died, down where for cleansing from sin I cried, there to my heart was the blood applied. Glory to his name. I'm so wondrously saved from sin. Jesus so sweetly abides within. There at the cross where he took me in. Glory to his name. O oh, precious fountain that saves from sin, I'm so glad I entered in. There Jesus saved and keeps me clean. Glory to his name. Come to this fountain so rich and sweet. Cast our poor soul at the Savior's feet. Plunge in today and be made complete. Glory to his name. Now I want you to really think about living your life for the glory of God this coming week. You may not have even had a thought of it at all last week. And God, forgive us for that if we haven't. But I pray that right regular in my own personal devotions and prayer life. God, bring glory through Jesus to thyself through me. Bring glory through my life to yourself. I hope you'll pray that. And I hope you'll mean it. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think. Well, Lord, I can ask and think about some mighty big things. He can do more than that. According to the power that worketh in us, right here, unto him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. One of these days you'll be saying glory be to God around the throne. Let's start down here. Heavenly Father, Lord, what a privilege it is to be in the family of God. What a privilege it is to know we're saved. What a blessed privilege it is to have Christ as our Savior and God as our Father. 
Now, Lord, sometimes we can get so caught up in ourselves. Not sin so much, although there is that. But just caught up in our busyness and our duties of life and our helter-skelter living and the things we have to do and the schedules we have to keep, the agenda that's on the board. that We just wind up running around in circles and not trying to give glory to you. Teach us how to pray that we might get glory from our lives and then how to live it, to pray it and to live it. I ask you to come and pray tonight if God has dealt with you about bringing glory to him or seeking to bring glory to him through your life. I wonder if you even thought about it at all this last week. Please think about it this week. Won't you come? just to think about it, but the purpose to do it. It's up to us. We can live for ourselves and all this down here, or we can live our lives seeking to bring glory to you. Put it in our hearts to do so. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. God bless you. We're dismissed.